The emergence of regular transcontinental passenger and cargo services, made possible by the adoption of steam propulsion, created intense competition among companies operating ocean liners. This competition extended to determining who operated the largest liner, which liner could cross the Atlantic the fastest, and who could secure the most lucrative mail contracts from their home country. There are many examples of competition among companies operating similar routes, but perhaps the most well-known example is the rivalry between Cunard and the White Star Line. These companies, founded five years apart, competed for decades to construct and operate the largest, fastest, and most reliable ships at sea. This competition gave birth to some of the most iconic ships of their time. However, due to tragedies and world events beyond their control, both found themselves in dire financial conditions in the early 1930s, leading to their eventual merger in 1934 to obtain financial support from the British government. To explore this competition, which led to some of the most impressive ships of their time, we first need to examine how these companies started. Welcome back to Compelling History. Today we continue our four-part journey through the history of ocean liners with part two, the intense industry competition, focusing on the rivalry and eventual merger of Cunard and the White Star Line. Check out part one on our channel to learn how ocean liners emerged from sailing vessels and make sure you're subscribed so you know once part three is released next week. Part one, background. In 1840, Canadian entrepreneur Sir Samuel Cunard along with steamship engineer Robert Napier, founded Cunard. This venture was initiated after Sir Cunard secured a contract from the British government in the previous year to transport mail across the North Atlantic. Sir Samuel Cunard and his partners successfully won the contract from the British government in 1839 to establish a regular and dependable mail service between Britain and North America. Prior to this, starting in 1756, the British government had been operating monthly mail ships between Cornwall and New York, which exclusively carried mail and few non-government passengers. However, as the number of ships making the crossing increased, the government began to consider whether it would be more cost-effective to retire government mail ships and outsource this service to companies that were already following the same route. This change would also have the added benefit of reducing wait times before a ship arrived to pick up the mail. In 1836, a parliamentary committee decided that the the ships operated by the post office should be disposed of, and mail transportation should be entrusted to private companies. The British Admiralty would oversee the contracts and determine which companies would obtain them. During a visit to London for other business matters, Sir Samuel Cunard met with his friend Joseph Howe, who was involved in the new Admiralty contracts. They discussed the opportunity to profit from this venture, especially since Howe owed Cunard a substantial sum at the time. Cunard returned to Halifax to raise capital, and during his absence, the rebellions of 1837 to 1838 unfolded. Howe, who had returned to London to lobby the government, saw this as a crucial moment to establish a link between Cunard's home port of Halifax and the British Empire's mainland. Competitors placed two bids for the transatlantic route before Cunard returned to London, where he began negotiations with another friend at the Admiralty, Admiral Perry, whom he had known for 20 years since Perry's time stationed in Halifax. Cunard proposed a bi-weekly service between London, Halifax, and Boston, scheduled to commence in May of 1840. Although Cunard and Howe had not yet acquired a ship, Cunard utilized his extensive political and business connections on both sides of the Atlantic to secure the necessary resources for construction or purchase. Despite not having ships ready, Admiral Perry accepted Cunard's offer of £55,000 for a three-ship transatlantic service. The subsidy was later increased to £81,000 for a fourth ship and expanded ports of call. The inaugural voyage of the first ship, RMS Britannia, took place on July 4, 1840 traveling from Liverpool to Halifax and Boston. However, the first Cunard voyage occurred two months earlier when a coastal paddle steamer named Unicorn undertook the company's first voyage to Halifax, initiating the supplementary service between Montreal, Pictou, and Halifax. To fulfill their contract obligations, Cunard needed to establish regular services for both the supplementary route and the main service that RMS Britannia and its sister ships would provide across the Atlantic. Failure to meet these requirements could result in the British government not renewing or terminating the contract. One of Cunard Line's most significant advantages in its early days was its contract with the British government. While this imposed pressure to maintain a regular schedule, it also allowed Cunard to present itself to passengers as a reliable and efficient means of crossing the North Atlantic. Originally named the British and North American Royal Mail Steam Packet Company, Cunard would become renowned in the its early days for its fast and regular transatlantic service between Liverpool, Halifax, and Boston. 
The first ship of Cunard's inaugural Britannia class, RMS Britannia, was a hybrid sail and steam-powered liner launched in February of 1840. It commenced regular North Atlantic crossings in July of that year. The ship itself had a tonnage of 1,154 tons, measured 207 feet in length with a 34-foot beam and 16.8-foot draft, had a capacity for 115 passengers and 82 crew members, and was propelled by both sail and two large paddle wheels on either side, which were powered by the ship's steam engines. During its maiden voyage, RMS Britannia completed the journey from Liverpool to Halifax in just 12 days, surpassing the previous record set by the Great Western by almost 48 hours. After a brief stop in Halifax, Britannia set off for Boston and again arrived two days ahead of schedule. Britannia then repeated the same route in reverse, this time crossing the Atlantic in just 10 days, setting a record that would stand for over two years. Britannia had five sister ships, Acadia, which was also known for its speed but never secured the Blue Ribbon, Caledonia, which served in regular transatlantic service, with the company for 10 years before being sold to the Spanish Navy. Columbia, another fast ship that held the Blue Ribbon for three years before wrecking off the coast of Nova Scotia. Hibernia, which entered service in 1843 and later operated on Cunard's New York route. And Cambria, a replacement for the lost Columbia that held the westbound Blue Ribbon for three years. In the early days of the Cunard Company, all these liners operated routes departing from Liverpool and heading to cities on the East Coast, such as Halifax, Boston, and New York, on a regular basis, fulfilling their contracts for many years following the initial 1840 voyage. While the primary motivation for establishing the company was to fulfill the British government's mail contract, Regular passenger services also constituted an integral part of its operations, making it the first company of its kind. As was common at the time, Cunard ships were divided into first, second, and third class, with separate accommodations for each. First class passengers enjoyed entertainment and recreational areas that the other classes either didn't have or had in a diminished capacity. These amenities were crucial to passengers during long journeys or extended periods of bad weather at sea. However, this didn't matter to many of Cunard's passengers at the time, as a large number of third class passengers were immigrants traveling to the New World in pursuit of a better life or greater opportunities. Five years after the founding of the Cunard Line, John Pilkington and Henry Wilson established their own shipping company known as the Liverpool, Melbourne, and Oriental Steam Navigation Company. Later, due to obvious reasons, the company was renamed the White Star Line. While Cunard was renowned for its speed and efficiency, the White Star Line became known for its emphasis on comfort and luxury. In its early days, the White Star Line initially operated a fleet of sailing ships compared to Cunard's hybrid steam fleet, and it only provided service between the UK and Australia. This route became crucial after the 1851 discovery of gold reserves in Australia, leading to a significant influx of people hoping to strike it rich during the early days of the gold rush. While Cunard offered some recreational areas aboard their ships for passengers to enjoy, the White Star Line's approach left a more lasting impact on passengers. The company was known for having bans on almost every voyage, providing a luxury not very common at that point. These bands were used to relax passengers during rough seas and became infamous during the Titanic disaster when the ship's band continued to play until the very last possible moments. The White Star Line operated several ships during its early years, with one notable liner being the RMS Taylor, a 230-foot iron-hulled clipper designed for speed despite its large size. Unfortunately, this ship proved challenging to control, leading to its service being cut short after only 48 hours when it ran aground during its maiden voyage on January 21, 1854. Following this incident, White Star Line opted to order more standard-sized clippers that better suited their needs for the long UK to Australia services. During this period, White Star Line also expanded its operations to include transatlantic routes, serving ports such as Montreal, Halifax, Boston, and New York. Unlike their expansion into Australia, their expansion into routes connecting Liverpool with cities on the west coast of the Americas, including Victoria, BC, San Francisco, and Valparaiso, was largely driven by the ongoing gold rush taking place up and down the west coast and into the northern Canadian and American Klondike regions. However, White Star Line's expansion into new markets was followed by a leadership change around 1856, when its co-founder, Henry Wilson, wished to continue focusing on building larger and more luxurious ships even after losing vital postal contracts to competitors. White Star Line's other co-founder, John Pilkington, left the company shortly after Wilson, leading to Wilson's brother-in-law, James Chambers, taking over as the new head of the company. Undeterred by their internal troubles and fearing falling further behind, White Star Line launched its first steamship in 1863, the SS Royal Standard. This 255 feet, 2,033 ton steamship had three sailing masts. While the ship survived longer than 48 hours, 
years, it led a tumultuous life, first sustaining damage after hitting an iceberg in April of 1864. It then had its engine removed and was converted to sail power in 1868, finally being wrecked on the Brazilian coast a year later in 1869. In the latter half of the 19th century, Cunard had a streak of new vessels that either lasted longer than 10 years or were sold off before any harm could befall them. Part two, the competition. Cunard and White Star Line would grow to become two of the leading liner companies of their day. They engaged in intense competition with each other on many UK-based routes, but nowhere is this rivalry more evident than on the transatlantic route. The peak of their competition during the turn of the 20th century was characterized by continuous back-and-forth improvements in luxury, as well as significant increases in the size and speed of their vessels. These innovations in both passenger comfort and engineering advancement were supported by subsidies granted to both companies over the years, as well as their competition for government contracts for mail and other cargo. As mentioned in the previous video, shipping companies began constructing larger and larger vessels to accommodate more passengers and cargo. This strategy resulted in lower costs per person or per unit of cargo cargo, making voyages more cost-efficient. The competition to have the largest and most technologically advanced ship on the transatlantic route intensified, compelling companies to continually outdo one another. A notable example of this rivalry is White Star Line's decision to order the Olympic-class fleet of ships, surpassing Cunard's new sister ships, Lusitania and Mauritania. These sister ships were built in part to give British liners an edge over the new liners emerging from Germany and America. Lusitania boasted a tonnage of 31,550 tons, a passenger capacity of 2,198, and required around 850 crew members, with Mauritania being quite similar in size and passenger capacity, with a few minor alterations. These ships were exceptionally large for their time, while also being among the fastest on the transatlantic route, which greatly appealed to passengers when they entered service in 1907. Recognizing that their current fleet couldn't compete, White Star Line's president, Bruce Ismay, devised an ambitious plan to create a class of liners that were larger and far more luxurious than Cunard's new liners. White Star Line approached their longtime shipbuilding partner Harland and Wolf in Belfast with a request to construct three of the largest liners ever built, the RMS Olympic, RMS Titanic, and RMS Britannic. While only the Olympic had a long and successful career, with Titanic's story being infamous and Britannic being converted into a hospital ship due to its completion just before the outbreak of World War I, the excitement surrounding both Olympic and especially Titanic's maiden voyages cannot be overstated. These ships, if able to operate as intended, would have posed formidable competition to Cunard, French, German, and American liners. Titanic, in particular, offered significantly more luxury than other liners of her time, with spacious and elegantly decorated cabins private promenades, and grand common areas for first-class passengers. Furthermore, second- and third-class amenities on Titanic were considerably better compared to other lines. This is just one example among many that contributed to the development of larger and larger ships. While Cunard began focusing more on comfort and luxury long before Lusitania and Mauritania, speed remained a primary focus for them, while White Star Line primarily emphasized size and luxury. Ever since the dramatic shortening of transatlantic journey length provided by early steamships, technology has continued to advance. Cunard and White Star Line ships regularly competed for the Blue Ribbon, which signified the fastest transatlantic crossing, along with other liners navigating the North Atlantic. The term Blue Ribbon is believed to originate from the blue pennant that British Royal Navy ships would fly from their mastheads when they achieved the highest speed during sea trials. In the context of ocean liners, this achievement was something advertised by ships currently holding it and remained an iconic symbol of travel until the onset of the jet age, shortly after World War II. While Cunard knew it needed to focus more on luxury and passenger experience, it never lost sight of the importance of fast and reliable service across the Atlantic. White Star Line was not as fortunate as Cunard, achieving the Blue Ribbon only once in January 1873 when the SS Baltic made the crossing in 7 days, 20 hours, and 9 minutes, traveling from New York to Queenstown. The influence of government contracts and subsidies on the development of the ocean liner industry cannot be underestimated, particularly concerning the success and ongoing rivalry between Cunard and the White Star Line. The British government often provided these subsidies to promote the growth of liners that symbolize national pride. It's worth noting, although we will delve into this in a future video, that ocean liners were frequently repurposed for troop transport during times of war. Governments like the British offered subsidies to ensure these ships could be swiftly converted into troop carriers when needed. Since Cunard was founded after 
Sir Samuel Cunard secured the initial mail contract from the British government and didn't want to lose that income to a competitor. The growing prominence of the White Star Line posed a threat to Cunard's management. These contracts were often structured to ensure that the winning company operated the highest quality and most seaworthy vessels, intensifying the competition between liner companies like Cunard and the White Star Line. While both companies secured contracts with the British government, Cunard was notably more successful in securing contracts compared to its counterpart, the White Star Line. This was likely due to the different business models of each company, with the White Star Line prioritizing the passenger experience over the speed and efficiency of Cunard. However, both liners continued to compete for larger vessels, which in addition to passenger capacity could carry more cargo and mail to fulfill government contracts. Nonetheless, this competition for larger and more efficient ships was accompanied by external factors beyond the control of these companies, leading them both into years of difficulty. Part 3. Merger on April 10, 1912, White Star Line's newest and most luxurious liner, RMS Titanic, embarked on its maiden voyage from Liverpool to New York, making stops in Cherbourg and Queenstown. However, just four days into the journey, Titanic struck an iceberg 600 kilometers southeast of Newfoundland and sank in the early hours of the following day, resulting in the loss of 1,500 of its 2,224 passengers and crew on board. This tragic event became the most infamous maritime disaster in history, which lingered for the remainder of its existence. The Titanic disaster caused irreparable damage to the White Star Line. The company had been promoting the ship as unsinkable for months, leading up to its maiden voyage. But once it sank, it shattered any confidence people had in White Star Line. This loss of confidence not only took a toll on White Star Line's passenger numbers, but also affected the entire industry. Passengers became far more cautious in the years following the sinking of the Titanic. Despite this tragedy, White Star Line continued to construct new ships and provide services across the Atlantic. Nevertheless, the Titanic disaster would forever tarnish the company's image in the eyes of the public. This stain would soon be overshadowed by another tragedy in Europe two years later that would affect every ocean liner company in the world. World War I. Before the outbreak of the war and exacerbated by it, White Star Line was struggling to cover the financial losses resulting from the sinking of the Titanic. The cost of building the ship itself was immense an expense that had been planned to be paid off over years of service that would no longer be possible. In addition to this, the disaster brought other financial costs that the company would struggle to cover, such as substantial financial liabilities received from lawsuits filed by the families of those lost and the new regulatory requirements put in place following the Titanic inquiry which further added to the company's financial troubles. World War I dramatically affected the operations of White Star Line and competitors like Cunard, which was also facing industry ramifications from the Titanic disaster as passenger numbers were down across the board. Once the war began, both companies saw a substantial requisition of their ships to serve as transport vessels for bringing troops from North America, Australia, and other current or former British colonies to join the war effort. World War I dramatically affected the operations of White Star Line and competitors like Cunard, which was also facing industry ramifications from the Titanic disaster as passenger numbers were down across the board. As mentioned earlier, many ships were requisitioned for military or medical use for the war effort. These ships were well suited for transporting large numbers of troops, especially when refitted for this purpose, and had ample room for patients to recover or undergo surgery. However, as with Cunard's Lusitania and White Star Line's Britannic, Titanic's sister ship, companies with ships requisitioned during the war often lost them while they operated in hostile waters, like the North Atlantic and Mediterranean. Even the ships that were requisitioned couldn't turn a profit as demand plummeted. Many larger and newer ships were forced to either be gutted for service or tied up at port accruing fees. This had devastating effects on the entire industry, from which it would never fully recover. This time period was also notable for the drop in civil ship production, as most shipyards and materials were commissioned for building and repairing military vessels. After the war, it took some time for ships to return to civilian service and for shipyards to transition back to producing civilian vessels. While certain companies received German liners as war reparations, this did little to compensate for the losses of British liners during the conflict. In adapting to the new financial realities of the industry, both Cunard and White Star Line had to reassess which routes remained profitable and which services needed suspension. They also had to reconsider the size of their fleets and whether it was feasible to return to their pre-war ship numbers. Like any war, technological advancements were made that could be applied to civilian vessels. Both companies aim to incorporate these advances in design and propulsion into their new ships, albeit at an additional cost during a period where cost reduction was essential. To support this iconic British industry, the government once again intervened to assist the struggling Cunard line in its recovery. With a substantial loan to construct two new liners, Cunard embarked on the construction of the RMS Queen Mary and RMS Queen Elizabeth. White Star Line, though receiving some governmental support, still faced challenges in regaining its former status before the war 
and the Titanic disaster. These difficulties were exacerbated by the 1928 stock market crash, which triggered a global depression. The onset of the Great Depression had a devastating impact on every industry worldwide, with certain regions being affected far worse than others. During tough financial times, the first expenses to be cut were vacations and non-essential travel. This meant that ocean liners were among the earliest to experience the full effects of the Great Depression. There were few people, both in Europe and North America, who could justify or afford transatlantic voyages or journeys to more distant places like the Far East and Australia. The decrease in ticket revenue led to a halt in the construction of new ships and the reduction or elimination of routes that were no longer profitable. The conditions created by the Great Depression greatly strained Cunard's resources, but were considered by White Star Lines management to be its breaking point. Both companies had a desire to complete large new liners with what would have been White Star Lines Oceanic and what would become Cunard's Queen Mary. The British government agreed to provide financing to the companies, but only on the condition that they merge into one entity. The merger took place on May 10, 1934, with Cunard owning 62% and White Star owning 38%, resulting in the new company named Cunard White Star Line. Cunard contributed 15 ships, while White Star contributed 10 ships to the overall fleet of 25 vessels. While both companies were in financial trouble, White Star was in a far worse situation than Cunard. Cunard began absorbing White Star Line assets, which were then either disposed of or sent to the shipbreakers. Among these assets were White Star Line's RMS Olympic and Cunard's RMS Mauritania. Cunard continued to have a significant stake in the merger until they eventually bought out White Star Line entirely and changed the company's name to Cunard Line in 1949. It wouldn't be long after this that the jet age began, leading to the sharp decline of the ocean liner industry. Conclusion the era of transcontinental passenger and cargo service, made possible by steam propulsion, ignited fierce competition among those in the shipping industry. From building the largest liners to achieving the fastest Atlantic crossings and securing lucrative mail contracts, companies like Cunard and the White Star Line engaged in relentless rivalry. Their fierce competition led to the creation of iconic ships, but unforeseen tragedies and economic challenges in the early 1930s left both companies in dire straits. In 1934, they merged, seeking financial support from the British government. This marked the end of intense competition, but ensured their continued operation. This historical rivalry showcases how competition spurred innovation and shaped maritime history. While they merged for survival, Cunard and the White Star Line's legacy lives on as a testament to the pursuit of excellence on the high seas. Thank you so much for watching the second part of Compelling History series on ocean liners. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, make sure to like and subscribe to help the channel grow. Next week, we'll be coving the wartime service of ocean liners, so make your subscribe so you don't miss out. Now enough from me. I want to hear from you. Do you have a favorite between White Star Line and Cunard?